Hello! I am now going to be doing a review of one of my favorite series. You've probably seen me quote it many times in the past, and there are times I'd actually call it my Bible. So let's have a look at the Babylon 5 series. Hey, you're missing a few movies. And a spin-off. Well, I am actually just going to do the complete series. No cancelled projects of any kind. Now many of you might think that I'm crazy having in the beginning, in the middle here, and though it might introduce us to the characters well, it can still be a bit confusing if you hadn't seen the seasons prior. In my personal opinion, I'd put this movie between seasons 3 and 4. The best place to start would be at The Gathering. It began in the Earth year 2257, with the founding of the last of the Babylon stations, located deep in neutral space. Created in 1993 by Joseph Michael Straczynski, the pilot episode known as The Gathering sets the stage for the rest of the series, introducing us to the characters as well as a few plots that will in time be revealed. Babylon 5 is a five mile long space station created by the humans as a symbol of peace after a long, harsh war with the Minbari. Reason why it is called Babylon 5 is because the first three stations were destroyed by Savatars and the force disappeared mysteriously. Its crew consists of only humans and houses a quarter of a million people of varying species. Many of the alien races have a representative there, serving as an ambassador to their home world, among which are the four major alien governments. Delenn of the Minbari Federation is pretty much a leader among her people. The Minbari are a very religious people whose holy number is three. Three parts to a story, beginning, middle, end. Three tenses, past, present, future. Three castes, religious, warrior, worker. Due to a misunderstanding, the Minbari were at war with the humans, but at the Minbari's moment of victory, they surrendered. No one knows why except some of the religious caste. The reason does get revealed eventually. Londa Malari of the Centauri Republic. Now don't be too quick to judge his hairstyle. Even though he looks like he got a bomb dropped right on the top of his head, this is the first take on the series. It does get better. Suppose we could excuse it with that he has lost all care in the world. His position of ambassador was given to him simply because no one else would take it. In short... A joke? Yes. And a bad one at that. <laughs> The Napoleon or Roman style of the Centauri pretty much symbolizes their ways. They felt that they were the heart of the galaxy, the almighty people conquering other planets and claiming they created hyperjump technology. They shared much of this technology with the humans. However, not everyone were pleased to see them. Jukar of the Narn regime is Londo's arch enemy. A hundred years ago, the Centauri and Narn met. No one knows what really transpired, but according to the Narn, the Centauri invaded and enslaved them. According to the Centauri, the Narns were barbarians, tried to civilize them, but the Narns wouldn't have it, and a war broke out. This war hasn't stopped, and the reason seems to have been forgotten. Jakar is mostly off the profit, and will sell to anyone. The profit he makes will evidently lead to buying more weapons to be used against the Centauri. The final representative is Kosh Naranek of the Vorlon Empire. The Vorlons are an ancient and mysterious race of enigmatic beings. No one knows exactly what they look like, yet everyone will recognize their appearance. Kosh is the last representative of the major races to arrive on Babylon 5 and is mysteriously poisoned as soon as he does. One problem arises when the Vorlon government insists that no one break his encounter suit and see a naked Vorlon. Let's talk about him in shyness. However, Commander Jeffrey Sinclair, top-ranking officer on the station, tells Dr. Benjamin Kyle that the doctor's oath of confidentiality is good enough and that Sinclair will take full responsibility. Kill the monitor. Stop all data recording. I don't want any record of what goes on in there. Jeff! I take full responsibility.
Dr. Kyle comes to the conclusion that it is poison, but can't do anything about it unless he knows which poison was used. He gets an idea, a very risky one, and consults his second-in-command Lieutenant Commander Lowell Takashima. He suggests using a telepath to go through Kasha's mind and find out exactly who did it and how it was done. We still have to talk her into it. No, absolutely not. After arguing the situation, she delves in. I don't know why, but the way the suit is opening, it is almost as if Kosh is inviting her inside. In a, in a, in a skin tab. Who did it, Lita? He did. He's the one. He tried to kill the ambassador. Okay, I'll agree that something does fall a little weak here. Why would the Vorman expose himself if their appearance should at all times remain a secret? I guess the poison could have entered one of the nozzles, but still. I was talking with Kosh earlier, and I remembered something I never could quite figure out. Kosh wears an encounter suit to protect him from our atmosphere, so how did the poison get into his system? His hand should have been completely covered. While Commander Sinclair stands trial for attempted murder, Security Chief Michael Garibaldi tries to help out his friend and investigates as much as he can. Sinclair claims the lift kept him from getting to the reception, but there were no records supporting that theory. Molari didn't make it to the reception either, because he met a very nice man who claimed he could help Molari win at the casino. The only problem was that this particular man was found dead, and the time of death was estimated to be several hours prior to Molari meeting him. During which, the telepath Lita Alexander stops by to visit Kosh. Or does she? What are you doing? Stop! You're killing me! The ambassador. I think I got to him in time. Now, oh, would someone please tell me what the hell is going on around here? Well, wouldn't Jay like to know? After some more digging around, they discover that someone has smuggled aboard a changeling net, allowing someone to look and sound like anyone else. A system like this would have to put out a lot of energy. Laurel. Can you recalibrate the station's external sensors to scan for energy sources inside the station? We can try. Good, do so. Garibaldi and I will be along shortly. We have to stop at security. There's a few things I want to pick up. So the hunt is on. They chase the person a little, and it comes down to a brawl between him and the commander. The Minbari sets off a bomb, and Sinclair hightails it out of there. And makes it in the nick of time. Do you need anything? Coffee, two sugars, cream, and aspirin. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that. Or? I'm sure you're seeing a few holes in the story, but remember that this review is only a quick look. And speaking of holes... Dylan, just before he died, the Minbari assassin looked at me and said, there is a hole in your mind. An old Minbari insult. Nothing you need worry about. Hmm, notice the shift in her eyes? Trying to hide something, I would think. But what? 
Well, you just have to watch the series through and through. It does get better. Once the series was a go, Joe Michael Straczynski really put some more effort into the story. He had definitely planned out at least four years of the story fully, if not more. The show was in a way revolutionary. It did things no other sci-fi show did before. One of the things was that it spanned a five-year story arc. The other was that all the space scenes were computer generated. Not bad considering this was made in the mid-90s. There was a slight change in cast, but was properly explained away. Dr. Benjamin Kyle was replaced by Dr. Stephen Franklin because of his bright idea of bringing in a telepath and foregazing upon the face of a warlock. Lieutenant Commander Laurel Takashima was replaced by Lieutenant Commander Susan Ivanova because she was part of Dr. Kyle's bright idea. Commander Jeffrey Sinclair stayed for one year and was then replaced by Captain John Sheridan. The reason was that Commander Sinclair was told the whole truth about the Earth Minbari War and was then reassigned as a human representative on the Minbari homeworld and a little more. However, there is another reason why the actor had to leave. Michael O'Hare suffered from paranoid delusions. Halfway through filming, things were getting out of hand. Joe Straczynski offered to suspend the show so that Michael could get the treatment he needed. But Michael didn't want to put the show or the crew's jobs at risk. He pushed on, agreed to complete the first season, but asked to be written out of the second season so he could seek treatment. And I commend him for that. Despite his mental illness, he managed to get through that one season and a two-parter in season three. He retired from acting some years later and wasn't seen in public since. He then died in September 2012, so God bless him. Getting back to Babylon 5, as the seasons progress one is told of a great darkness to come. Ancient beings known as the Shadows, known to be the arch enemies of the Warlords, like the complete opposite. Wars are fought, wars are won, struggles get resolved, conspiracies born, and secrets revealed. But not all of them. The series also contains history lessons simply by repeating them, as well as other political struggles. Now, as I said, once you've watched seasons 1 through 3 and the last episode ending on a cliffhanger, now would be a good time to watch In the Beginning, which tells the story of the Earthman Bar War from the perspective of Londa Malari. Then we continue with season 4, where one war is completed. And then we stop after episode 8 and watch a movie called Third Space, which tells of an ancient device that opens the gates of hell. Then it's back to season 4, where a conflict escalates and is resolved with almost total destruction. Come season 5, Commander Susan Ivanova leaves and is replaced with Captain Elizabeth Lockley, now commanding Babylon 5. This season is filled with problems with regards to telepath rights, Jakar's position among his people, and allies to the shadows making a mess of things. Now somewhere between the next to last and the last episode, there are about 19 years worth of stories that could have fitted in, but only a few managed to get in and were sort of cancelled. One of which is a movie called River of Souls. It is a complete movie and a small side story pertaining to the mistakes of a race known as Soul Hunters. Then there is the spin-off Crusade, starting with the pilot movie The Call to Arms. The story did seem kind of promising, but then... no. Just... No. Lasted 13 episodes and was cancelled. The synopsis is that the Shadow Allies poured a plague onto Earth and now there is a hunt for a cure. We know something has been found based on the final episode of Babylon 5, but we never know how it was found. It had some interesting messages in it, but it wasn't especially good. But if someone can write a solid final episode, or a movie, where, the, where a cure was found, I'll gladly accept this. May even accept it as a book. There was also the beginnings to a series about the legend of the Rangers, but the pilot couldn't kick off the series. 
And finally, The Lost Tales. It was supposed to be a number of episodes, but only two were created. The reason was that Straczynski wanted to make something spectacular, but Warner Brothers would not give the budget needed, or even the full creative license. Straczynski announced that he would not do anything more with Babylon 5 until he got the budget he was looking for. So there you have it, Babylon 5. I thoroughly recommend you getting at least the main series, being The Gathering, In the Beginning, Third Space, River of Souls, and All Five Seasons. There are also book versions of In the Beginning and Third Space, and from what I've seen, many other books written. Best thing about an holy bible. Except I don't follow it to the letter. There's, uh, there have been some other things that have influenced me somewhat. Which could be a problem if I am to know who I am. But anyways, may we all meet again in the place where no shadows fall.